You know, there are a lot of reasons that I love Student Takeover Sunday. I, one of the biggest reasons I love is that there just aren't a lot of churches that are willing to take on something like Student Takeover Sunday. But it sure is fun to see our students serving and sharing and leading. And now you get a super young hip guy to bring you the message. Look, I look good for 50, okay? I'm, I'm not 50, but I would look good for 50, okay? <laughs> I don't look great for my real age, but I get that. Hey, but I, I love a Sunday like this. Okay, I love that there's a church, that we are a church that's willing to, to, take, a, to, to take a moment, to take a Sunday and put our kids on display like this. And it's just one of those things that I, I wanna remind you of. You know, on Easter Sunday, we had 600 kids birth through fourth grade down in our kids' programming. You know, that's, that's pretty incredible. We had, you can clap for that. Yeah, you should. Uh, when, when we saw 350 kids come to our community dodgeball event, which was unbelievable. You know, I'm, when you are, uh, some of you, when you're kind of crossing the lobby or you're trying to make your way down and you know how like on a lot of Sundays, the pickup lines for the preschool rooms are longer than like the line for the new iPhone. You know, some of you parents know, some of you parents know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm just reminded when we look around and see God doing what he's doing right here at Cherry Hills, it's important to remember that that those kids and those students, they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. They're the church right now. And when you choose to make an investment in them, when you choose to make it possible for kids to go to camp on scholarship, when you choose to make a commitment and investment in the programs of the church, in the ministries of the church, and in, in building enhancements and future building growth, I think so often our mind is drawn to like, well, that's a future thing. But what I would tell you is that those decisions are having impacts right now. Um, on the Wednesday before Easter, probably most of you don't know this, we had 16 teenagers and 20 grade schoolers show up here to go hang door hangers on the doors in the neighborhoods around our community. I mean, there's not a lot of teenagers willing to do that. Uh, at our dodgeball event, we had a young man give his life to Christ who was growing up in a Buddhist household. And after Kurt presented the gospel, hey, yeah, you can clap for that too. I got a lot of stories today. But after Kurt presented the gospel, he went back to Trailhead and he told Tyler, he said, I've heard about the religions of the world. And that's the first one that's made sense to me. And I want Jesus as my savior. Like, like what, I, what I wanna make sure that we never miss is that we've got a front row seat right here to a God who is working right now. And yeah, the next generation will have an impact on the church going forward, but very much so God is doing an unbelievable work right here and right now that we know God loves his bride, the church. And all throughout scripture, we see that he loves kids. And God is doing an unbelievable work in both of those situ situations right now. And I think he just continues to prove. He's a God who shows up and he's a God who is proving right here at Cherry Hills that nothing is irredeemable by him, amen? Aren't you grateful for that? And I, I, I am just so grateful because we're just scratching the surface. We're so far from being done. Those stories, those testimonies, those highlight videos, you know, being able to make VBS free this year, not turning away a single kid. That's gonna be an unbelievable opportunity Opportunity. Youth camp is coming up. We're about to welcome a huge group of interns. If you know a college aged student who's still unsure about what they wanna do this summer, we still have room and we'd still love to talk to them. And we're getting ready for another huge event. If you were here on Super Bowl Sunday, we're getting ready for a, an event called Night of Champions with Bo Nix, who is the quarterback at the University of Oregon. And we are gonna bring him in. And our hope is that uh, you would come and you would bring your kids and your family and hear him and his dad share some of their stories. But we're gonna invite every local varsity football team to come for free, to have a meal, to hang out, to engage in some competitions against other schools, and then to come in here, hear the story, and for us to present the gospel. God is so far from done moving. And I'm just grateful to be a part of it. Grateful you're here, grateful my family's a part of it. And I'm thankful for a God who shows up, for a God who saves, and for a God who sows back what the enemy has tried to rip apart. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Amen, indeed. But speaking of the next generation, I have two tax credits myself, okay? They're 10 and 11. 
And the other day I have them out at the Park Meadows Mall. So I've got one in kids ministry, one in student ministry, and we've got them there at the Park Meadows Mall and that we made the mistake of going in the Lego store because I was like, honey, we have to go in there. But we went in anyways. And then my kids are like, dad, we need this new Lego set. They, they literally, they have a million Legos, okay? I step on them every night, they're everywhere. But I thought about how often I share that same need with my wife, honey, I need this new pair of shoes, okay? I literally own a million, okay? Well, I don't need, I'm, I'm in not need for anything anymore. But this morning, even though it's Takeover Sunday, we are continuing in this series, I've Got Questions, with I think just an unbelievable follow-up question to what Kurt unpacked last week. And it's the question this morning, does God still show up? Does God show up anymore? And so I just want you to think for a minute as you just kind of frame what might be your need. If you were to say, man, does God still show up? Does he still show up to this situation? Does he still show up to this moment? Whatever it is, what would you say your greatest need is this morning? Now, certainly many of you very analytical would say, well, I would say our need is food and air and water, right? That would be our most basic need. And yet others of you would say, well, I, I really could use community. I could use belonging. I could use just kind of settling in, finding a, a place to belong, a, a place where I could do life alongside people. And then yeah, others would say, no, our, our need is very tangible. Like I, we need healing. We need a job. We need God to show up and make ends meet. I need God to heal our marriage. I need God to redirect my wayward child. Some of you would very easily be able to just say out loud, God, I need you to show up and fill in the blank. And so this morning, uh, I hope you have something to write with. I hope you have something to write on. And I would love for you to turn in God's word to Acts chapter nine. We're gonna be in verse 32 is where we're gonna start. Acts chapter nine, uh, verse 32. As we try to answer this question, God, do you show up? God, do you still come on the scene? And we're gonna look at an incredible story that does that. And what we see here in Acts chapter nine, verse 32, is that as Peter was traveling the region, he came to the saints who lived at Lydda and he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, make your bed and notice this. Immediately he got up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Now, this story actually contains a second situation. It says, now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated in Greek is called Dorcas. And this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died when they had washed her body and laid it in the upper room. But notice this, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men imploring him, don't delay in coming to us. And so Peter arose and he went. And when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room and the widow stood beside him, weeping and showing him all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make them. But Peter sent them out and he knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. She gave her his hand and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive and it became known all over Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. You see today, I don't know what you're walking through. Today, if you're wondering if God is showing up, if you're wondering, can God show up and heal this broken relationship? If you're wondering, can God show up and and heal this, uh, this sickness? If you're wondering if God can show up and make ends meet and provide you the funds you need. If you're wondering if God can show you the wisdom and the discernment to navigate this situation. The question that I would first present to you is that when you read the truth of scripture, when, when you are turned to the truth of God's word and you're asking that question, God, are you gonna show up to this space in my life today? The question that I would first ask is, when you go to God's word, do you see it as the truth that it is? Or do you often find yourself kind of viewing it as a tale of fiction? See, it's probably the greatest, most significant change we've made in the year that I've been here. So we made a huge change in our curriculum across our entire next-gen ministry. And I, and I get that we like topical series. This is a wonderful topical series. I, I get that we love application. 
we're going to go away tomorrow and plan the next series for a whole year. And we try to kind of balance those things out. But what I would remind you of today is that there is no topical and there is no application without the truth of God. Now we have to have this foundation. We have to have this base and we want our kids to know it so bad because when we look at scripture, we see Paul, he went from Saul, the greatest enemy of the church, to Paul, the greatest evangelist for the church. And it wasn't the result of a self-help book or a TED talk. It was the result of the truth of scripture that says we serve a miracle working God who has a history and a track record of showing up. And I'll just tell you this today, he's still a miracle working God who has a history and a track record of showing up. And if you're in this space this morning and you believe that with all your heart, let me just say, praise the Lord. But if you're in this space this morning and you're struggling to believe that, if you're in this space this morning and you say, I, I'm really wrestling to feel peace about that. Does God really still show up? Is he really gonna show up to, to this situation of need in my life? Then I would also say, praise the Lord, because I'm gonna give you just some great truth straight from scripture this morning that I hope you can cling to and you can hold on to. And so as we look at the question, God, do you still show up? As you're asking that question this morning, I've got this need, God, are you gonna show up in this situation? The first thing I want you to remember, the first truth I want you to hold on to is that in order for there to be a miracle, there has to be a problem, right? If you're, if you're facing a difficulty this, this, today, if you're facing something that needs healing or restoration or whatever, if you're, if you're facing something that you need God to put back together, listen, in order for God to show up and do something, there has to be something wrong. So if you're facing something wrong, you can cling to that to say, hey, miracles. I think miracles are just God's solution to the problems that we face. In order for God to show up, there's gotta be something only he can fix. When did God first show up? He came down literally to earth in the form of man. Why? Because there was a problem here on the earth that only he could fix, sin. And here, one of the things that we try to do is we have a goal. We try to know you by need and by name. It's really our goal. We, we truly wanna know your name. It's why we stand in the lobby. We, we want you to introduce yourself, but just remember there's a lot of you. There's very few of us. So like introduce yourself at time or 10, okay? It helps, helps us get to know you a little bit better. But when you're checking in your kids in the kid lobby, when you're navigating our guest services team from your car to your worship center seat, when you're riding the golf cart, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what felt needs exist in your life and what things can we do a good job of meeting for you. But the reality is, is that collectively speaking, our greatest need today is that we're sinners and we're forever separated from a holy God. And so when we look at our passage, when we look at our piece of scripture today, it's, we kind of see this huge need that pops up. We, we see the two needs that pop up, that is Peter is traveling through the region and he comes to the saints, what do we do? He, we find a man named Aeneas who's been bedridden, who is paralyzed. Now, some of you know that just a few weeks ago, I, I broke my foot, five weeks ago, I broke my right foot and I am healed today. I'm a medical marvel, they say. I went to the doctor, I said, hey doc, how is it? He said, it's not healing. I said, look, you can clear me or I can quit showing up. We could, I mean, we could do this the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> what do you want? Said, Cleared it is. But that's not actually the first injury I've had on this foot. I actually had a full reconstruction of this ankle. And for 14 days, I was bedridden. I had to lay completely flat. I thought it wouldn't be that bad. I had a little bell, I thought I would ring it. My wife would bring me stuff. She took the belt away from me, beat me with it. It's a, it's a miracle I survived. <laughs> but Aeneas' situation, right, it's so much worse than that. He's completely paralyzed eight years. And yet, that's not the only issue in the scripture. Because in Joppa, what? We know there's Tabitha. She's sick. She falls sick. And she has passed away. You know, it's really two issues that the church can't really fix. There's two issues here. There's two problems today. And I don't know where you might put yourself this morning if you would say, hey, what, what I need is some food. Hey, the food, the church can fix that. You would say, hey, I, I need someone to pray with me. We would love to do that at Trailhead. You need a connect group. You need community. Those are all things the church could provide. Or you would say, hey, I need miracle healing. I've got a kid. I, I prayed with an individual in the first service who's, who's got a grand 
daughter who's just so off the rails and he's just broken and crying. Hey, like I, I can't fix her, but God can. And, and I don't know where you would find yourself this morning, which side of the coin you would be on. But, but what I would tell you is that there's hope because that in order for God to show up and do a miracle, there has to be a problem. And what we see here is a problem that God shows up because there's always hope that's found in a God who shows up. And he's omnipotent and he is all powerful. And the result is that he could have healed Aeneas and he could have raised Tabitha from the dead any way he wanted. Clap of thunder, a snap of his holy hand, right? Like he could have literally picked any reason, but what we see in the healing is that there's this truth out there that God so often shows up through people of faith. Such a great truth to cling to this morning is that so often God arrives on the scene through someone of faith. God so often shows up in people of faith. I was a kid's pastor too, just like Kurt was. And it's amazing the number of testimonies that I've heard of people who said, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but there was a lady who lived next door who took me to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. For some of you, that's your testimony. Hey, my parents weren't saved, but my friend's mom would bring the minivan through our neighborhood, right? And she would load the car up and she would take all of us to church. For some of you, there's a relationship with Jesus today in your life because of an aunt or because of an uncle. For some of you, there's a relationship with Christ because there was a coach who saw something in you and who shared Christ with you. There are, there are story after story after story of people who say, man, I had this happened in my life, or I'm follower of Christ today because God showed up through a person of faith in my life. And it's such an important piece to remember that he's all powerful and he's all knowing. And you know what? He doesn't need us. Sometimes as pastors, that's a hard deal, right? He doesn't need me or Kurt or Gary, right? He doesn't need our team that he could do the work here that he's doing without us. He can save without us. He can redeem and restore. And yet for some reason, one of those things that we'll just never know, part of his redemption plan has involved being co-laborers with us in this season. So this morning, whatever you're facing, whatever you're, you're wondering, whatever it is that you say, God, are you gonna show up and do something? God, are you ever gonna show up and fix this? God, I've been crying out to you for so long. I've been crying out to you for years after year after year. God, you see the hurt that this situation is causing. God, are you really gonna show up and do this? What I would ask you is what kind of person of faith are you in the waiting? As you're asking the question today, God, are you gonna show up? What kind of person of faith are you being? What kind of people of faith are you surrounding yourself with? It's one of the most important things about being a part of a church that we talk about is that you're just surrounded of people who, who you have a circle, who, who view life the same way and who think the same way. What kind of person are you? As you're saying, God, are you gonna show up? What kind of person are you in the waiting? And my encouragement to you this morning would be so simple. Don't waste the waiting Whatever it is, God, when are you gonna show up? God, are you still out there? Don't waste the wait. Don't waste the season of waiting. Don't waste it running. Don't waste it panicking. Don't waste it angry. Don't waste it fearful. Don't waste it hoarding. Wait well. And I think if you were to ask me today, the greatest lesson over the last two years, certainly over the last two years, there's been a lot of things that could cause us to panic. There's been a lot of things that could cause us to freak out. And if, and if you just want my opinion, the greatest lesson over the last few years, the greatest lesson of COVID, the greatest lesson of Russia, of economy, of border, of whatever it is, sickness, hurt, the greatest lesson, whatever it is that you look out over the world and you say, that is causing me to panic, that is there a God still out there? Does he still exist? Is he ever gonna show up? The greatest lessons from all the turmoil that's going on in the world around us, I think all of it just serves to say that we serve a God who does not have all his eggs in a basket for some government of the world to rise up and save us. He's not sitting around waiting for some country to come to our rescue. He's waiting for the people of God to fall on their face and cry out to him. Say, God, we need you. How are you waiting? What kind of person of you are you in the waiting? 
At birth, I was born with a lot of difficulties. I was given very little chance to live. But I had a God-fearing grandmother who chronicled every day of my six months in the NICU, who organized a prayer chain from California to Carolinas without email, right? Crying out, believing that God would make a way. And I think so often we say like, God, where are you? We ask that question, God, where are you? God, are you gonna show up? But I would ask you, how are you asking that question? Or are we doing it with our hands on our hips? Like, God, I just don't think you're out there. I don't think you can do this. Or are we doing it with our knees on the ground? But today, if, if that's you, if you're asking the question, God, do you still show up? Or are you waiting, counting the minutes? God, I still don't see you. I still don't see you. Are you waiting, crying out to him? Whatever it is, don't waste it, but wait well, because faithful waiting is just this idea of believing God has a reason. He's got a reason to leave you on the scene, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's hard, even when you feel useless, even when you feel like a burden to others. Waiting well isn't hoping it all works out, it's knowing it all works out. Waiting well is making the decision that says, man, I've got two choices here. I can be angry and anxious, or I can just be in awe of a good God. I can be furious, or I can be faithful to him. Waiting well is just understanding. He may not show up at the time that you want. He may not move the mountain how you want but he is a God who is always faithful and he's been faithful time and time again. And the third truth is maybe the most important one to cling to today. If you're asking the question, God, are you gonna show up? God, do you see this situation in my life? Are you ever gonna show up? Here's what you need to know. God alone has the power. There's no one else that can show up and do anything. So if you're asking the question, God, are you gonna show up? You need to know the power is only found in him. We see that in our verses here this morning. What did Peter say? He said, Jesus Christ heals you. He points very clearly to where that power is. When he goes to heal Tabitha, he knelt down and he prayed because there's no one else, there's no other power, and there's no other way for the problems in your life to be fixed. I'm gonna say it again, because some of you are struggling to wait well. Some of you are saying, God, are you gonna show up? And you've, you've just come to a place where you've bought the lie of the world and you've said, hey, God's just not gonna show up. He's not gonna do it. He's not coming. I've gotta fix this problem on my own. And you're trying to fix that problem with power. You're trying to fix it with money. You're trying to fix it with status. You're trying to fix it with drugs, alcohol, instant fulfillment and gratification. Some of you believe all the problems in your life could be fixed by this relationship. Some of you put all your hope in this guy or this girl. Some of you put all your hope in your kids. You're just clinging to them. They're my fulfillment. Let me say it again. There's no one else. There's no other power. And there's no other way for the problems in your life to be fixed. You need to hear this so clearly this morning. Without the power of God, impossible things will always be impossible. It's him and him alone. He alone has the power to do it. Every problem, every difficulty, forget it. He's not caught off guard. He's not overmatched. You, it's okay, I think it's okay to cry out, God, this doesn't make sense. God, where are you today? He's not like, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't show up on my to-do list today. Sorry, I didn't know you were going through that. He's not shocked. He's not distant. He's very present and he has been, he always is, and he always will be. And scripture confirms one truth, he's the alpha, He's the omega, he's the beginning, he's the end. And most importantly for us in our question, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God who shows up over and over and over again. But understand this, truth number four, when he shows up, he shows up with a purpose. God always shows up with a purpose. Look here at verse 35. We see this really clearly. All who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, Aeneas, but notice the purpose here. They turned to the Lord. 
Whenever God shows up, there's always a purpose that is showing up. And I think this is something we so often miss. God's character is not affected by the circumstances of your life. Just because your life is bad right now doesn't mean God is a bad God. Just because your life is broken right now doesn't mean that God is broken. Just because you are confused doesn't mean God is confused. Just because you're lost or uncertain doesn't mean God is lost or uncertain. What we see time and time again, and if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to, to go back and watch Kurt's message because they just go together so well. Because what we know is that God works according to his purpose and he works according to his glory and he uses all of these things, these trials and these difficult seasons, why? To pull people back to him that they might be saved and come to a relationship with God Almighty. That he works so differently than man because he works in such a way to bring glory to God and God alone. And every single thing. And I think that, it's a part that's not fun to hear sometimes. It's a truth we don't often share in church, is that God isn't working all things out so that we can have this life here on earth of health and wealth and prosperity. Every single thing that he's ever done hasn't been to prepare a perfect earth, it's been to make a way for us to experience a perfect eternity with him in glory. And we get to see that in verses 41 and 42, that as he raised Tabitha up and he presented her alive, look, many believed in the Lord. He shows up and he acts, but he always acts with a purpose. And I'm driving the other day with my oldest, she's 11, and really having the girls just a year apart, it's a fun season in our house. It's stressful at times. It's emotional at times, but it's really a fun season. They're really neat kids. And they're just in this like, they're just in this fun season. And we're driving and she's talking and she's just a million miles an hour and she's telling me about school and friends and, and camp. She just got back from Hydra Haji and she's just going on and on. And I'm like, I'm staring at this 11 year old who's like 16 in the passenger seat. And I'm just this wreck of emotion because I know the season we're in, right? But I know the season we're headed to, right? I know I'm about to have two teenage girls in the house. But I also know statistics. I know the world. I've done kids ministry for the bulk of my life. And, and I know the world that they're headed into. And I know how dramatically different it is than it was for us when we were kids. And, and one of those big words that caused it is cell phones, right? Kids today are exposed to depression. They're exposed to mental health issues. They're exposed to identity issues. They're exposed to graphic content that never, there's not even a word to compare how much worse it is for them than when we were kids. And then what was already the most difficult generation to ever grow up in experienced the most unprecedented thing that the world has ever seen called COVID lockdowns. And the state for our kids today has been pushed off the deep end. And literally what I do every day is I study what's going on with our kids and our families. And I'm watching my little girl and I know what's coming. And I know the difficulty that's out there. And yet, I would also know that those same problems that she's about to encounter head on, there's many adults in the room going through the exact same thing. Many of you in here today battling depression, anxiety, lack of worth, sense of belonging. You're scared for your kids. What's this world that they're gonna grow up in? You're scared if you can provide, make a way. How am I gonna pay for college? How am I gonna get my family through this? And it, in just my final minute with you, here's what I would say. God 
can heal and he can redeem and he can restore and he can put back together and he can find, he can do anything it is that you ask of him because there is nothing that our God can't do, okay? You need to hear me say that. And listen, he may choose to do that for you right here on the earth, right now, very present. He may choose to heal that sickness. He may choose to mend that relationship. He may choose to redirect that wayward child. He may choose to mend the hurt or whatever it is. He may choose to do it right here on the earth in a very real way. Or he may choose not to. And we're left with one of those questions of why that we'll only know when we get to the other side of eternity. I remember being in that situation when my dad suddenly passed away. God, why? I remember saying, I'm gonna ask you that the second I get there. The second I see you, I'm gonna ask that. And I am so grateful for incredible pastors of wisdom and, and strength who said, hey, Bronson, that's fine. You can hold to that if you want to. But I'm pretty certain when you're face to face with God Almighty, you're not gonna care about the answer to that question. And can I just direct you to this right here? The greatest miracle isn't that God showed up and healed Aeneas. The greatest miracle isn't that he showed up and brought Tabitha back from the dead, as great as those are. And the greatest miracle won't be that God puts your marriage back together. The greatest miracle won't be that he heals your loved one. The greatest miracle won't be that he cures you of your depression. The greatest miracle won't be that he redirects your wayward child. The greatest miracle won't be that he makes ends meet. Although we would praise him for those things, the greatest miracle of all is that God came down to the earth in the form of man and he made a way for us to be freed from our sin and spend all of eternity with him. That's the greatest miracle. Because here's why. That's the greatest solution to the problem that we face. Our greatest problem is sin. But thanks be to God, our greatest hope is Jesus Christ. And you see, that's the reason that we gather this morning. That's the reason that we worship. That's the reason we invest in kids and in students. That's why we invest in young adults and senior adults. That's why we invest in mission trips across the country and around the world. And that right there, church, is the hope that we cling to as the world falls apart around us and continues to break because we know one day, very soon, just as he said he would, he is going to show back up here on the earth and he is going to redeem it all. And what a glorious, glorious day that'll be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tell you what, let's pray together. Father, thank you for being a God who shows up. Thank you for being a God who makes a way. Thank you for being a God who sows back. God, as I look, Cherry Hill's story is the story of a God who shows up and redeems. Our very story is of a God who's made a way where it looked like there was no way of all peoples on the earth, we have had a front row seat to some of your most unbelievable work. And we thank you for that and we praise you for that. We're so grateful that you're a God who shows up. Lord, for the person in this room this morning who just desperately needs you, who's just crying out with that situation, God, certainly I would pray that you would meet that need, that you would provide that comfort, you would provide that support, you would provide that longing, whatever it is, the healing, the restoration, whatever it is, God. And yet if you choose not to here in this space and here in this moment, Lord, I pray, it would praise you in that storm anyways, knowing that one day you're gonna redeem it all and we won't know those hurts and we won't know those pains and what a day of rejoicing that will be. Thank you for showing up in our lives through people of faith, in people of faith. Thank you for showing up in the most darkest moments. And that person in this room this morning who feels like they'll never see you again, Lord, I pray you just remind them right now. Or maybe you just touch them in a way where you just remind them of your presence. We thank you for being such a good, good God. It's in your name we pray, amen.